When the Buddha taught the path, he said it leads to awakening, leads to nibbana. But he didn't list awakening or nibbana as one of the factors of the path. The goal is one thing, the path is something else. That's why there's the image of the path. And unlike the relationship between craving and suffering, he didn't say that the path was the cause or the origination of the goal. But it gets you there. These points are important to keep in mind, because all too often there's a tendency to think that by cloning awakening you can get there. But awakening isn't something you can clone. Instead, the Buddha has you think strategically. What things do you do that will bring you to the point where you arrive at awakening? And they're very different from the awakening itself. There are some similarities. Concentration is very calm. Wisdom is very clear. Virtue can be pure. But these things are all fabricated. Whereas the goal is something else entirely. And you get there not by imitating the goal. You get there through a process of approximation. Even though awakening can happen in a moment, and you're awakening to something that's potentially right here in the present moment. Still, you have to develop your discernment. You have to develop your skill. And as with any skill, it's going to go through levels of refinement. And it includes factors that, you're, that are very different from the goal. Things like the desire of right effort, wanting to do things skillfully. And even though we're here to get rid of aversion, there has to be a certain amount of aversion to the results of unskillful behavior to begin with. That's something that's going to get honed down. But just because it's there doesn't mean that you're going in the wrong direction. You're learning how to approximate things. It's where, like we're, we're digging for gold underground, and you don't dig for gold with a gold shovel. You take an iron shovel, a steel shovel. It's like trying to get fresh water out of salt water. The salt water may be cool, and you want cool, fresh water when you drink it. But you don't go straight from the cool salt water to the cool, fresh water. You have to take it through heat first. You heat the water and distill it, and then it can cool down again. So there are parts of the path where you really have to put in energy, and that's going to require a desire. Making concentration, creating a state of concentration in the mind, you're staying, creating a state of becoming. That too requires desire. It's simply a matter of learning how to refine your sensitivity to, as to what's skillful and what's not. What kinds of desires are skillful, what kinds of desires are not. What kind of skillful qualities are appropriate for one particular situation and which ones are appropriate for another. Remember the teaching on the seven factors for awakening. The calming ones are useful for when the mind is feeling frenetic. The energizing ones are useful for when the mind is feeling sluggish. So even with skillful qualities, you have to learn how to make distinctions. And then beyond that, there are levels of concentration, levels of equanimity, levels of right view. These things will progress as you go on the path. But your initial motivation may have a bit of aversion in it. You're averse to suffering. That's fine. And you read about some of the Ajahns in Thailand talking about how they were using some fairly unskillful mind states to deal with other unskillful mind states. Now, as Ananda pointed out one time, there are certain unskillful mind states that are totally useless on the path. 
sexual desire is one that's totally off the path. As the Buddha, as he said, the Buddha cut the bridge to that one. That doesn't have any role in the path. Sensual passion doesn't have any role in the path. But, it, but there are other things related to conceit and craving, which are necessary. You have to want the goal, and you have to have the confidence you're good enough to do it. Now, conceit and craving bring with them some unskillful side effects. And as the path goes on, you're going to pare those down. But if you've got them, learn how to use them in a proper way. And John Lee tells of when he was a young monk, he would get into meditation contests with the other monks to see who could meditate the longest, do walking meditation the longest. And even though it was fairly childish, still it taught him some important lessons on how to sit long and how to walk long. Although John's talked about getting angry at their defilements, and that's perfectly fine. As you get more skilled, you begin to see where the anger is unnecessary, and then you can drop it. But don't get waylaid by the type of thinking that says, gee, you're awfully passionate about this, or you're awfully attached to this, or you're awfully negative about this person or the other person that you don't want to associate with. Well, when we realize that by associating with that, with that kind of person is going to take you off the path, so you've got to be careful. Heedfulness requires that you learn to be wary. So often we're taught that the Dharma is all about trusting. Well, you have to learn how to trust the Buddha and trust your desire for true happiness, but there are things you have to be worried about. I mean, that's what heedfulness is all about. So we're not being unkind when we decide that certain relationships have to be put on hold. And we haven't wandered too far off the path if we decide that we really are sick and tired of having our sensual desires take us over, and we want something better than that. That's how you motivate yourself. So there are times when you use unskillful qualities to get rid of other unskillful qualities, and then gradually things will get more and more refined especially as the path picks up on momentum. And the concentration itself, say, becomes your motivation, or the mindfulness becomes your motivation, your insight becomes your motivation. All this is achieved by success through approximation. So as John Lee points out in his talk on the various demons of defilement, some of them have their uses. You're a fighter as you meditate, and some of the most intelligent fighters are the ones that not only beat the enemy but actually can convert the enemy. You have to be wary about these things. But as long as you're alert, you're heading in the right direction. I mean, even good things have their dangers. But it's learning how to deal with whatever comes up, knowing the danger and learning how to avoid the danger. You can learn to put a lot of things to use that would otherwise be denied to you. If you're sitting here trying to clone awakening, desire is denied to you. Craving, conceit, all those things are denied to you. That means that you're, you're trying to follow the path without all, your, all the means that can get you down the path. And it's a kind of defilement that tells you, well, here you are trying to be peaceful, so why are you angry at your defilements? That's defilement taking on the, do the guise of Dharma. You have to be very careful about that. 
to have your wits about you. And that's what will see you through. <laughs>